and uh, I'm going to enter right into sharing screen here. Clean this up. Compress this down. So we've been talking about uh, some simple uh, artificial intelligence or artificial be uh, behaviors. Um, and I, I believe we worked on wandering last time. And so with wandering, uh, uh, we basically had these circles uh, and uh, uh, we're, we're using coroutines here because coroutines allow us to wait which is an important thing. Uh, we had this little uh, reset direction that threw a random vector inside a unit circle. So this is somewhere within this circle. Uh, and we offset this from our animator's root position uh, to give us a target position that our character would go to. And uh, in the idle function, uh, this is uh, uh, where it basically does its motion here. Uh, we had a couple of things. One, we threw random numbers in the range of 0 to 499. Uh, 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 and when particular numbers came up, we triggered the jump or the dive. And when particular numbers came up, we reset the direction with this little routine up here. Uh, the way we controlled our character was through the same speed and direction parameters that we controlled our, our user player. Uh, we had done the speed based on horizontal and vertical axes squared, uh, and we controlled our direction with the horizontal axis. Uh, we recognized that the dot product of two vectors is a cosine. And so if we dot the vector that we're facing, our, our forward vector, with the vector to the target, we can get that angle between these two. And if it's positive, that is if it's plus or minus 90 degrees, uh, we're facing the target, and if that dot product is negative, then we're facing away. The cross product is the sine of the angle, uh, and it produces a vector. So in the, the left-hand coordinate system of the world, if I dot my facing vector with my target vector, I get a negative y vector. And this tells us whether to rotate to the right or to the left. So our, our direction is the magnitude of the y component of that cross product vector. And this is what we had in our target position. Uh, if we were uh, outside this inner circle, then we set speed to one uh, with a damping time. Uh, we have our current direction, which is uh, our animator's root rotation. That's a quaternion, as you recall. And a quaternion times a vector rotates the vector. So I'm rotating the vector forward, which is 0, 0, 1. Uh, so my current direction is the direction that my animator is facing. My wanted uh, direction is the vector between my root position and the target. And uh, here's the dot product. If it's greater than zero, then I do the cross product and get the y component for that direction parameter. Otherwise, if we're facing away from it, I want to turn as fast as possible. So I take that y, y component of the cross product and if it's greater than zero, I do a one. If it's less than zero, I do a minus one. I rotate the other way. And I did clamp these to the range plus or minus one. And then just simply set the uh, direction to 
that value that I'd obtained from the cross product. And uh, this has a damping time as well. Uh, and if, if we're not outside that inner distance, then I'm going to reset the direction. And as you recall, I had a uh, timer that uh, also kept track of how long I had been uh, uh, wandering, in which case it resets the direction after a certain amount of time. And then it returns null. Uh, here's the place that we could put some efficiencies in here. Instead of doing this every frame, which is what happens when we return null, we could also put a wait four seconds in here and have this only trigger when we wanted it to. And so that could be much more efficient. Um, so to that's the wanderer. He's throwing a random target and going to it. So uh, doing the following AI is pretty simple. Uh, all we need to do here is specify specifically the target that we want to follow, uh, presumably our player. Um, so uh, here I'm going to have uh, uh, the, the, the circles. And I also have a distance in front. Uh, one of the common errors that people make with following AI is that they target the position of the player and so your following ai gets right up in the face of the of the character and stands right in front of you and the cameras can be clipping and doing all kinds of weird things and if you happen to have to fight that ai it can be difficult so having a distance in front is an important thing to include in our following ais so in the following AI, we have a start function that, of course, caches the animator so that we don't have to access it every time with a get component. Uh, we set the animator's speed to have a bit of variation. Remember back when I was playing with the dude and I had the boost function that uh, when I pressed the Q key, it made him run fast. And when I pressed the E key, it put him in slow-mo mode by changing the speed of the animator. And this is not the same as the speed, capital S, parameter that controls the transitions. This is a global uh, variable, a global setting for an animator that controls the overall speed of all of the animations. So I'm setting my speed to one plus or minus a random number between minus 0.4 and plus 0.4. And what this is going to do is uh, make our followers have a certain amount of randomness in how fast they run. The nice thing about the mechanism root, uh, root uh, motion animations is that as they take their step, they move a certain distance. So if we change the speed of the animations, uh, the, the ones with the lower speed will walk slower or run slower, and the ones with a higher speed will run faster. So if we're going to have many followers, there'll be some variation in their behavior. They won't all behave exactly the same. Now, I have this exposed variable for the target, uh, and it's by default null. Uh, so if, if there is not a target, if not target, I'm going to find the player. And the player is uh, the whatever character is tagged player. Uh, or I can, of course, put a specific target in my uh, public slot for the target, uh, in which case it won't find the player. And so we can specify a particular target. Now, the start function is an I enumerator, so it's a coroutine, so we can use the yield, and I'm going to yield return start coroutine, and I'm going to start the seek routine. And this is in a little while true loop, so it's, it's going over and over and over through this uh, particular uh, loop. We'll see what that's for in a little while here. Um, seek is going to look a lot like idle. Um, uh, idle that we just looked at that finds random targets, uh, except here, 
uh, the position we'll seek is going to be some distance in front of the target. So if I have an animator and a target, we don't have a target, we're not going to seek something. And then this is activated and enabled. Uh, and we'll come back to why this is there later when we get to a more complex behavior. But my target is going to be the target position. That's my player plus the target's forward vector. That's the player's uh, uh, unit vector in its forward direction times that distance in front that I want my target uh, that I want my AI to target. Uh, this prevents the following AI, AI from getting too close. And this is a common mistake that I see all the time. Uh, by putting it in front, it also puts it where the player can see it. And since we want to interact with these uh, AIs, uh, putting them in front is a good idea. You could also put them behind if you wanted to, but that would be dangerous. So the rest of it, uh, if the distance is greater than the inner circle, we have uh, this uh, inner circle that is going to say when we're close enough to our target, uh, I'm just going to go through exactly the same stuff that I did with the idle as it sought its random target, set speed to one, get the current direction from the animator's root rotation times the vector forward, get the wanted direction from the vector between us and the, and the position, not the target, but the position, uh, form these dot products and cross products, and set the animator flow. Um, so, uh, and of course, if we're outside, if we're inside the inner circle, if distance is lesser than inner circle, I'm going to set the speed to zero, and that makes my character stop moving. So, um, we had the wanderer. Uh, here's the follower, uh, um, and uh, I have a little overhead camera here that shows this the inner circle that is surrounding the target that's in front of me here if i move back that target follows me and if i turn to the right that circle moves in front of me and my little follower uh, very happily uh, will get in that circle as quickly as it can and it turns and uh, and moves and follows me as I move around the landscape. And it will always end up right in front of me where I can see it. And uh, this, of course, is a good thing. If you were targeting the player, it'd be right up in your face. And that's not a good thing. So um, the other kind of AI that we might have is one that flees from the player. Uh, and this is really simple to implement. The fleeing, uh, all we do is change the uh, calculation. Uh, if distance is less than the inner circle, then we're, we want to flee. If we're too close to our target, uh, then we want to flee. And the wanted direction is just the opposite of what we wanted when we were targeting the player, when we were following the player. So all I've done is change this to a less than and put a minus sign in front of the wanted direction. That's all we need to do to make a fleeing AI. So here's flee. And I believe in, in this case, I have a circle around my player and it's not in front of it. So that that's that inner circle. And anytime I push the, the player to or the AI to be inside the green circle, it wants to run until it's outside the circle. And then it stops and goes into its uh, its stationary state. So follow and flee are really simple to implement. Uh, and they're almost identical. 
Now, the problem, of course, with that follow behavior is the AI ends up just standing there when it gets to the target. And um, we'd, we'd like to really combine our idle, which is the wanderer, and the seek behavior, which is the chaser or the follower, so that when the AI is close enough, it will wander around. But if it ever gets too far away, it will then follow until it's close enough and once it's close enough, it'll resume wandering. And our character will now have two behaviors, idle and seek, or wander and uh, follow, however you want to call it. Now, the simple idea is to have two circles that surround our player or the target that the pet will seek. It might be displaced in front of us, but it's still the target. Um, and the inner and outer circles uh, when the pet is inside the outer circle it's going to wander it's going to do its idle if it ever moves outside that outer circle it will begin to seek it'll begin to follow and it will follow until it's inside the inner circle at which point it reverts to the idle wander state and it will wander until it goes outside the outer circle and then it'll seek. Now there are two approaches to this and I'll do both of them. I'll do the number one later with a, with a more complex uh, uh, character. Um, but another way to do this is to use these two components that I've got already, the wander script and the follow script. And I'll, put both of these scripts on my AI, and then I'll write a third script that will manage which of those scripts is active, whether it's wandering or whether it's following. So uh, I need some variables, of course, for the outer distance and inner distance. Uh, and I've got some Booleans is wandering and is seeking. And uh, uh, I'm going to cache variables for those two component scripts follow and wander that are on my uh, that are on my character so uh, i have the two circles i have these two booleans initially false and i have my uh, privates for animator follow and wander the uh, components that are on my character uh, the damping times and a distance so in start, which is a coroutine, an I enumerator, uh, 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 I'm going to cache my animator. I'm going to find the target if I haven't already specified one. And I'm going to get the follow component and turn it off. I'm going to set that script enabled to be false. And when a script is false, uh, when a script is false, it's this little check mark here in front of it is turned off. So from scripting, we can turn on and off uh, various scripts. Uh, I get the wanderer and turn it off. And then uh, if I have an animator, I'll again set some random speed uh, so that my pets have some variability. And then I enter this while true loop, yielding on a start coroutine wandering and yielding on a start coroutine seeking. Now remember, in a coroutine, when we yield, it waits for this to finish. So this is going to start wandering and it's going to uh, be in wandering until wandering itself decides to quit at which case it'll go on and do seeking. So uh, uh, inside a coroutine, these yields will, uh, will block until, until the start coroutine wandering or start coroutine seeking has finished itself. So wandering is pretty simple uh, because remember, we're doing all of the thinking with the uh, wander script with the with the uh with the wander script component that's on our character so all i'm doing here in wandering is 
A, testing to see if is seeking is true, in which case I, I break. I do a yield break, which is the which returns from an I enumerator. Yield break uh, leaves the, the wandering. So if in this loop here where I'm going around, if, if uh, my uh, parameter were true, if my is wandering were, were true, this would immediately leave. Well, if, if it is seeking, it would leave. Uh, otherwise, it's going to go ahead and set is wandering to be true and enable the, the wander script. And then entering its own while true loop, it's going to test the distance to see if it's outside the outer circle. Because if it's wandering and it goes outside the outer circle, it wants to stop wandering and start seeking. So if the distance is outside that outer circle, it sets is wandering to false. It turns off the wandering script and it breaks, which leaves this script. Otherwise, if it's inside that outer circle, it does a yield return null, which is just a wait for the next frame, and it goes around the, the true loop again. Again, this is where you could put a wait for seconds if you wanted to not do this every frame. So seeking is identical, except it tests is wandering to return. So if it, it gets in, a, in the seeking routine, and it's supposed to be wandering, it'll, it'll quit and go around that original while loop. Uh, if, it, if, it's, if, if it's not wandering, then it's going to set is seeking to be true, it's going to turn on the follow script. And if it has an animator and a target, it's going to enter its own while true loop that uh, does is exactly the same thing, finding the position in the distance. But now if the distance is less than the inner circle, that means it's gotten close enough to the target that it can stop seeking. It can now set is seeking to false, turn the follow script off, break, and otherwise uh, yield return null, uh, wait for the next frame. So uh, that's all we need for our pet routine here. Uh, and so if I look at our pet, and now my little gizmos here has uh, the inner and the outer circle. So you saw the little character uh, ran through the pink circle until it was inside. Now it's outside, so it's changed to seeking. Now it's inside the inner circle, so it's back to wandering. And so this thing is, is, uh, is uh, staying within the pink circle, uh, but when it gets inside the tan circle, it goes into its wandering behavior. And you could, adjust, of course, adjust the size of these circles to make the behavior different. And of course, if I run away from this little character, it very diligently gets back inside the circles and resumes its, uh, its pet behavior. Uh, so that's all very cute. Um, now, uh, I had that exposed target, which if I didn't put anything in it, would find the player. Uh, but of course, as an exposed target, I can put whatever I want in there. So I could actually put an object in there that the uh, pets would all kind of circulate around, or I can put the one of the other pets in it. So I can I can have this kind of chain of behavior. So here's a little chain of follows. This one uh, this one has nothing in the target, so it's going to follow the player. But Teddy Bear One is going to follow Teddy Bear Follow, and Teddy Bear Follow Two is going to follow One and on down the chain. So this little chain of follows 
is going to take off after me. Uh, that first one follows, then the second one follows it, and the third one follows it. And we have this chain of followers who uh, uh, all target each other. And I think that uh, the little followers of the teddy bear are, uh, uh, their offset position is behind the thing so that they end up all in a line. I'm not sure why you'd want to do that, but you could. Um, so here's a chain of pets. Uh, so this pet uh, in, a, in the Seek Wanderer Manager that is controlling these two scripts has nothing in its target, so it's going to find the player, whereas pet one is looking at teddy bear pet, pet two is looking at teddy bear pet one, three, and so forth. We have this chain of pets that are kind of following each other around and uh and they're all following the player but they're all following each other and if i of course dash off here one of them will follow me and the others will eventually follow it and so you have this little gang of uh pets that uh follow each other around and this you could make all kinds of different behaviors with this um uh, but um uh, uh, just that we can have this chain of follows where everybody's following everybody else. Incidentally, I didn't show you this, but uh, uh, if you set up a follower to follow a fleer, then uh, where are they? Uh, so I have a follower who's following a fleer, and of course, uh, uh, he's just going to chase him off the edge of the world, and that's the end of him. So um, we've got we've got these different behaviors, uh, and incidentally, just to show you, this works just as well on a terrain as it does on uh, uh, a flat plane. Of course, we have to remember to uh, put a character controller in here so that these guys can uh, sense the terrain below them. Uh, that's an important addition to have them be able to navigate on a terrain. But here's a bunch of pets in some little world here. And uh, there's one of them who's uh, uh, a follower who will just stand in front of me wherever I go. Uh, uh, and then there's a bunch of pets who are following, I don't know, me or each other or something. And over here is a fleer that I can chase uh, off the edge of the world. And the other thing I'll point out is you remember that these are all controlled by uh, the same animator, the idle run jump animator. Uh, and so since these work with any humanoid uh, characters, I can do this with a bunch of dudes. And so here's the uh, a bunch of uh, dude characters uh, running around on a world uh, on a terrain. Uh, chasing, play, uh, doing their flips and turns. And there's the follower who stands right in front of me, no matter where I go. Uh, and somewhere here, there's a chaser too. I mean, a fleer too, that I can chase off the world. I forget where he is. It's somewhere here. But anyway, um, so that's, a, a handy set of AIs. And I'll stop sharing here at this point and entertain questions. Um, when we get to the uh, final game, uh, one of the requirements of a final game is that you have an AI. And it. Uh, I will show you how to do enemy AIs that target your player and shoot your player or do something like that. Um, but uh, I, I accept pet AIs as, as, you know, little companion helpers that follow you around as you play the game. And, and that's fine, too. So it doesn't have to be a hostile 
And these are completely acceptable AIs to include in your game. You don't have to invent the wheel. Although I got email from somebody last night saying that they were doing the scriptable, the pluggable AI training for their advanced topic. And right in the middle of it, Unity deprecated it and turned it off and it's gone. And he was partway through it and was kind of upset. And um, I will tell you that their replacement, which is uh, autonomous moving characters or something, is very good. And, uh, and I did put an announcement in the bright space that this is an acceptable replacement for the uh, pluggable AIs with scriptable objects that has disappeared from Unity's website. So uh, you can do that one uh, to get AIs for our final project as well. Uh, any questions about a AIs or ABs, uh, artificial behaviors? We have a wanderer, we have a follower, we have a fleer, and we have this pet AI that fidgets around uh, our character. Uh, for the pet, um, go ahead. Say it again. I didn't hear you. Uh, for the pet AI, yes. When it's inside the outer circle, but outside the inner circle, can you remind me what what the behavior is? It's wandering. Wandering. Okay. It, 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 it's yeah. It's doing the wandering. So when it when it's when it's outside the inner circle. Well, when it's inside the outer circle. It's wandering. If it ever goes outside the outer circle, it switches to seeking and it seeks until it's inside the inner circle, at which point it goes back to wandering. And so, you know, if the circles are fairly close to each other, it's going to rather quickly wander out of the outer circle and turn around and come back in again. So adjusting the size of those circles can, of course, affect the behavior. And of course, you want that to be offset in front of the player someplace so that your your pet is visible. You don't want the pet to be behind you, and you definitely don't want the pet to be on top of you. You want it to keep a, a distance because otherwise funny clipping things happen with the camera and blah, blah. Okay? Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so let me go back to sharing here. And I'll close this up. Uh, quit this one. And I'll open the chasing AI. And this is this next one here is very similar. You remember I mentioned that we had two choices. We could write a single script that managed the different behaviors. Or we could do this trick where we just used our two wander and seeker components. Um, but, um, uh, and in this case, in this example, I'm going to do uh, the other one. So uh, let's see. On the pet, notice the exposed target. Uh, we can assign who the pet has followed so we could do the, the chain. So all that is clear. So with chasing AI here, um, I'm going to have three states. I'm going to have idling, which uh, is not, not wandering like in the last case. Idling is kind of going to be looking for our player. It's going to be motionless, but it's going to be scanning the environment to try and find my player. And it's going to scan the environment until it can see the, the target, at which point it will transition to chasing. Now, with chasing, at some point, it's going to get close enough that it can jump. And when it can jump, it's going to transition to the jumping state. And if it ever can no longer jump, it'll transition back to chasing. And if it can't see the player, it'll transition back to this idling state where it scans the environment looking for the player. So I have these three states. 
And I can kind of put this in my little controller here, the idle chase jump controller, uh, that has these three states. It has these three states, the idle state, the chase state, and the jump state. And I have three parameters here. Well, no, I have two parameters, can see and can't jump. And I have the usual speed and direction that that I uh, uh, that I use for uh, doing things inside these states. But I have these booleans can see and can't jump. And the transition between idle and chase is if I can see. And the transition from chase to jump is if I can jump. And the transition back of course, is if I can't jump, and the transition back here is if I can't, can't see. So uh, my, the state of my player, or my AI, is going to be controlled by these Booleans can see and can't jump. All of its transitions are controlled by that. So uh, the logic that is going to control which state I'm in is going to be if I can see, then I either jump or I chase. So if I can see and I can jump, then I'll jump. Otherwise, if I can't jump, I'll chase. And if I can't see, I'll idle. And idle, of course, is the scanner that's going to uh, uh, take care of things. So this is this is all of the thinking logic of my little AI. Now, uh, I'm going to write little simple functions to determine if I can see. So this is this is a slightly different case than the can see lowercase can see. This is an uppercase can see a function. And it's going to do the usual thing. It's going to form a vector to the target, uh, that offset in front of my character. Uh, I'm going to get that distance. And if the distance is greater than the C distance, a parameter I'll set in my AI, how far it can see. And if the distance is greater than the C distance, I'm going to return a false. Otherwise, I'll return a true. Now, one of the other things that I can do with this is I can add a field of view to my AI. And uh, uh, so here now I'm using the vector three angle <coughs> with two vectors, one, the direction to the target, and the other, the direction that my AI is facing. And vector three dot angle returns the angle between these things. So now if my distance is greater than the C distance or the angle is greater than the sight angle, I'm going to say the sight angle is say 40 degrees, in which case I can see everything in this 40 degree range, but I can't see things behind me or off to the side. So if it's greater than C distance or the angle is greater than the sight angle, I'm going to return a false, otherwise a true. So can C now has this added field of view. It's not just testing the distance to the player, but it's also testing whether I'm facing the right direction to actually see uh, the player. Uh, can jump is simple. It's just uh, that distance and whether the distance is greater than the jump distance, in which case it returns a false, otherwise a true. And so in our script, in our AI script here, we're going to have variables for C distance and jump distance. The C distance would be kind of our outer circle and jump distance and the inner circle. Uh, I've got uh, a rotation sp speed. I've got this public state that uh, is actually not used by anything except to, to, for debugging. Uh, so my, by making it public and setting it in the, in, in the script, I can watch the inspector and see what my character is doing. And then I have uh, uh, also the current distance is a public and sight angle and eyes. Uh, uh, it turned out that it was important to 
uh, look out of the eyes rather than out of the transform because the transforms uh, uh, root position is at the ground. And so I have these eyes that I can look out of that I can put on the head. Uh, privates for the animator, these uh, booleans for can see and can't jump, uh, some damping times for speed and direction. Uh, and in the start function, I'll, I'll catch a copy of the animator and I'll enter that idle state. Um, and uh, the update function uh, contains the details of the logic. So I'm going to get my current distance. Uh, actually, that's just for display purposes. Uh, and I'm going to set the Booleans can jump and can see. I'm going to set the parameters on my uh, uh, animator that are going to control what animations are occurring. And then uh, using those set Booleans, I'll decide what state I'm in. Uh, in terms of my thinking process, jump, chase, or idle. And remember, the root motion of our animator controls all the movement of the character. So I don't actually have to do any movement in, in jump, chase, and idle. All I have to do is set the various parameters uh, for my animator, and, and it takes care of the movement. So the animator controller idle chase jump, I, I already showed you the transitions, and uh, but uh, the idle state, uh, the idle state is uh, uh, an animation I found in the raw mocaps. Uh, it was idle turn right 45. Uh, and I had to do some fiddling to uh, trim down which frames I wanted to use because uh, the whole animation was uh, more than I wanted. Uh, and so it was part of an idle neutral 245, idle to neutral idle uh, that, that I used. So this is the thing that's going to make my character scan the environment, is this little idle turning that I think I can show you this over here, idle turn 45. Um, just turns my character a little bit. Uh, beach ball, don't crash. Don't crash. Didn't like that, whatever it was. So it's, it's just turning and it's, doing it with steps. It's not just rotating. You know, you could rotate rotate the transform, but that would just turn your character rigidly. And this is a nice little animation that turns my character a little bit every, every time it runs through it. So all that's pretty cool. And that's what the idle state is doing. Um, the chase state is a blend tree. Uh, a blend tree like we used with uh, with our player. It's got uh, uh, it's controlled by direction, uh, which is going to be set in the uh, uh, chase routine. Uh, just like we set the the, uh, the direction with uh, our our uh, back in the other assignment or the other uh, AI, uh, and I have three animations. Uh, their walk animations that I found in raw mocaps. There's a walk forward, turn left, and a walk forward, and a turn right wide that uh, were all uh, interesting animations that I found in the raw mocaps. So the chase is a blend tree controlled by uh, the direction here. And I believe uh, I can look at these here. Uh, and so uh, it walks forward, and as I turn to the right, as I turn to the right, it turns to the right, and as I turn to the left, it turns to the left. So I've got these three animations controlled by a blend tree. Um, the 
Jump animation is another one that I found in the raw mo caps, and it's kind of an aborted jump, uh, and it was misspelled. It's jump m j. I don't know how you pronounce that. Uh, uh, idle cannot up idle, uh, and uh, it's it's a little jump here. Uh, jump m j. Uh, it's a little jump like that. So it just jumps. And uh, um, it, it's going to jump whenever it's close enough to my character. So um, the transitions are all based on can see, uh, and uh, jump is based on can jump. Direction controls the speed of turning and so forth. Uh, and so here we go. Here's, here's this little character controlled by these different states. So uh, uh, Unity is crashing, I think. Actually, no, there we go. So it's, it's, uh, it's chasing me. It gets close enough and it goes into jump state. If I go further away, it chases me. If I run over here, it chases me. And it's turning appropriately to uh, uh, target me. Uh, and it, as long as it's inside that inner circle, it's close enough. It's going to keep jumping and uh, scowling at me. And if I go far enough away, it can't see me anymore. And so it goes into that idle seeking state where it's just turning and looking for me. And it can only see me when it's facing me. And then it goes into the target state. So uh, we've got this AI here that does what we want it to do. So um, the idle is, uh, uh, again, just setting this little uh, uh, string so that I can see it in the inspector. Uh, it sets its speed to zero and its direction to zero. They're not being used, so it doesn't really matter. What matters is that the state has been set to idle. Uh, jumping, uh, um, jump is uh, responsible for keeping it facing the player. And we can do this with a little slurp and a look rotation. So I get the face direction, which is the vector to my target. Uh, I turn off the Y so it doesn't rotate in some funny uh, upright fashion. Uh, and I use a quaternion slurp that replaces the target's rotation with the quaternion look rotation that looks in that face direction. And I do this with one of these transform rotation replacements with a rotation speed times time delta time. So this keeps my AI facing the player when it's in the jumping state. And I am technically rotating the whole thing, but it's doing it in small enough increments that you won't see any, any glitches. Uh, chase, of course, is more complicated. Chase has to... Uh, 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 get the current direction from the animator's root rotation and its vector forward. That's a quaternion times a vector that returns a vector rotated. The want direction uh, from the animator's root position and the target. Uh, uh, the the uh, current direction, because it's the vector forward, is a unit vector. And I made the wanted director direction uh, uh, a unit vector as well. Uh, the dot product to determine if we're facing, uh, uh, and the cross product component y to uh, assign to that uh, uh, direction parameter in the animator. And of course, if we're facing away, I use zeros and uh, ones and uh, plus or minus one. Uh, because I made both of these unit vectors, the cross product is guaranteed to be a unit vector, so I don't have to do a clamp anymore. 
So uh, I'm out of time here, but the next next thing I'll do is add a fourth state, a flea state. So now, uh, in addition to idle chasing and jumping, if they get too close, they're going to transition to a free flea state. And my, my character will now do this. Uh, idle jump chase flea. So my character will now do this. It runs away when it's too close. It's in idle seeking, then it's in, in uh, chasing. Now it's the right distance. Now it's too close and it runs away. Uh, uh, seeking, idling. So now we have this character that uh, is seeking us. We're too far away for it to see us. I can sneak up behind it. It can't see me until it turns and faces me. And then it goes into that, that jump state. Um, in addition, what we're going to do with this is we're going to replace that, that jump state with, uh, with an attack. Uh, we're going to replace that jump state with an attack. And so when it's in the jump state, it's going to start doing something uh, to my player with this particle effect that it's bouncing particles off me and taking health away. And so that jump state has become an attack state. Of course, if I chase it, it can't chase me and I can run away from it. Get out of range. No, get out of range. Uh, uh, I guess this one can see a long distance. But anyway, uh, we'll do that next time. We'll add this fourth state and uh, and add a behavior to this that uh, that is going to shoot particles at my player and damage my player. So all of that will be cool. And I'm sorry, but I've taken a little bit more time than I should have. So I'll stop sharing and entertain questions. Thank you. Looks cool, doesn't it? Yeah. I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>